Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third U.S.-China Relations Forum. What do we should know about Chinese history? It is 7.01 p.m. of Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of the United States. Good evening, good morning, and a good afternoon to our dear friends as dis distinguished audience from all around the world. We were expecting more audience locally from New England and are thrilled to find out quite many audience from all around the country and even other countries. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome. My name is Ben Xia. I'm with New England Chinese American Alliance, also known as NICA. NICA is a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote civic engagement, political awareness, and political participation of the Chinese communities. We have multiple programs and initiatives going on. Among them, we regularly organize webinars are open to the public. Today, we are so honored to have Professor Peter Bo to speak with us. Professor Bo is a renowned educator, historian, and a sinologist. He is the Charles H. Carswell Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University, and the author of numerous books and articles in Chinese, Japanese, and English. As the Vice Provost of Harvard, he was responsible for Harvard, Harvard X, the Harvard Initiative in Learning and Teaching, and the research that connects online and residential learning. He led Harvard's university-wide effort to establish support for geospatial analysis in teaching and research. He was the first director of Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis. He also directs the China Historical Geographical Information System Project, a collaboration between Harvard and Fudan University in Shanghai to create a GIS for 2000 years of Chinese history. In a collaboration between Harvard, Academia, Sinaka, and Peking University, he directs the China Biographical Database Project, an online relational database currently of 420,000 historical figures that is being expanded to include all biographical data in China's historical record over the last 2,000 years. Those were really grand epical projects. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Bo. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak with our community. Would you like to greet our, our, our audience, Professor? Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ben Xia. Uh, thank you, uh, Zhang Wanhua, for also being the moderator for this discussion. Um, shall I just begin? Oh, I, I will introduce Wenhua as the moderator very quick. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Bo. And for today's event, we will have Mr. Wenhua Zhang as the moderator. Wenhua is an investor and a board member of a U.S. listed public company. He was a portfolio manager at Harvard Management Company, managing its public equity investment in China and it was a director at the Bain Company. Welcome. Wenhua, please. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Professor Bo. It's a pleasure to have Professor Bo talking to us. And the format will be about 20 minutes of a lecture from Professor Bo. And after that, we'll go into Q&A. So for the audience around the world, hello, and please do send your questions through the Q&A channel on this uh, YouTube and, which, um, and on, the, on the Zoom. Without further ado, Professor Bo. Thank you very much. And, and it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here with you tonight. Um, Nika has uh, really been very responsible and very active in trying to think about um, the current pandemic situation we're on and how we can help each other across the oceans. And let us hope we can also help each other as we think about 
the bad state of Chinese-American relations today. And that really is, gets at what I'm concerned with. Um, you know, um, it's a difficult moment, uh, particularly if you're um, a US citizen in China or somebody, a Chinese citizen or somebody of Chinese descent in America. It's a moment of great tension. Many prejudices are unleashed. Uh, it's always good to keep in mind that we want to remind people in China that uh, all of the United States is not represented by President Trump. And of course, we want to remind people in America that not all of China is represented by Xi Jinping. My, my mission as a teacher and as a scholar has been to learn about Chinese history so that I give an Americans a more full a more complex view of China as a country that's been part of the, an important part, an essential part of the history of the world for thousands of years. Um, you know, our, our China X courses that, that we developed, our long China series on Harvard X, the online courses reached half a million people, right? Um, Chinese students have been taking China X uh, or uh, courses in the United States off of Harvard X and off of edX, um, around 50,000 people this year from China, 50,000 from Hong Kong, another 15,000 from Taiwan. But I'm really, from, from my perspective, the most important thing has been as we designed numerous courses online about China to be able to get 500,000 people taking those courses here. Um, I love using history as a way of undermining the assumptions we make about each other, the assumptions we make about the past and, and our tendency to think that the way we are now is the way we must be and is somehow inevitable. Um, today, I want to tell you, I'm gonna talk for around 20 minutes because I think there's a lot to discuss. I'm gonna tell you four stories. A couple of stories are basically, one story is based on personal experience. One is about history and a couple are about um, things that uh, Confucius said, in fact, because he's a person who's worth thinking about. Um, my first story goes back to a number of years ago when I had taken a group of American students from Harvard and volunteers from Earthwatch to do field work in the middle of Zhejiang province in Jinhua, right? Um, and to look at old houses and old villages and their, their family histories and things like this. And we were all on a bus, maybe 40 or 50 of us on a bus going from one village to the next. And in those days, they were just beginning to build roads. And they had built a road, they had poured the, the, the concrete, the shreni, right? So that the, it was like this. And our bus tried to go over it like that. And it got stuck on the top. And so I said to the bus driver, well, why don't we get everyone to get off the bus and the bus will be lighter and maybe you can drive over the hump. And he said, no, no. And so we waited. And then I said, you know, bus driver, we're going to try anyway. We'll get off and we'll help push the bus. And so I said to everyone on the bus, in English and then in Chinese, we need to get off the bus. Um, and explained it. And all the Americans immediately got up and got off the bus. And all the Chinese students and Chinese professors stayed on the bus. And one Chinese professor said to the other, he said, these, the Americans, look at those Americans. They, their, their leader just says something and they immediately follow his orders. And so I had to go seat by seat, row by row, asking my Chinese colleagues also to get off the bus and all help us push. And so we got off the bus and we all pushed together 
and the bus came off the road and we were able to continue. And the next day, I was talking to one of my Chinese colleagues who was on the bus, the one who said, look at those Americans, they all just obey their leader. And before I go on, let me tell you why I tell this story. I tell this story at the beginning of class in history class in America at Harvard, because I want to make students realize that their assumptions about China are not always the right assumptions. Remember, Americans tend to assume that Chinese all follow the leader, that Chinese act as groups, that Chinese are committed to uniformity, that they have no individuality. And so the next day when I asked my friend, I said, so what do you admire about America? He looked at me and he said, you know, thinking about yesterday, what I realized is that what's admirable about America, what I admire about America is that you have no individuality. You're all alike. You all obey the rules. And we Chinese, we're so individualistic. We're so individualistic, we just can't cooperate. We need to be more like Americans and stop being so individualistic. And when I tell this story to an American student audience, they all sort of say, what? That's the opposite of what we think. And yet, if you think about it, in American society, we really are, in many ways, a society of rules where we expect people to follow the rules. And one of the reasons perhaps today people are so upset with President Trump or so many people is because he doesn't believe in following the rules. But I don't want to offer him as a Chinese model, but in China, I think society is much more negotiated. It's relationships. It's the negotiation between people. It's not a matter of rules. But these two tensions, right? One hand believing in rules, and one hand believing in personal negotiation are real. And of course, both societies have both. So that's my first story, which is really about getting us to question our assumptions about each other. My second story goes back to something those of you my age will remember, the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. People like Ben Shah, they were born after that, so they don't, they don't, they don't remember this. But I began, I went to college in 1966, and in 1967, the Cultural Revolution, the Wunga, began. And the Red Guards came out into the street. And the Red Guards began to attack as they came to the countryside, the, 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 the Sugu, right? The four olds, the old ideas, old culture, old habits, old customs. Um, there was a denial of the value of the past. There's gonna be a new revolutionary China guided by Mao Zedong Shexiang, by Mao Zedong thought. It will be freed from history, right? And of course, um, it meant terrible, terrible destruction. One of the things I saw doing field work in the countryside was how much had been destroyed. Uh, family histories decimated, religious sites decimated, texts, ancestor portraits, genealogies destroyed. Right? No one then, no one then in China or in the West could imagine China today. None of us could see that, that China today would be what it is. An enormous country with what will soon be the largest economy in the world, with an infrastructure, an investment in infrastructure that is to be envied, with extraordinarily fast expanding education, with well-governed cities, with tremendous national pride. In the 1960s, we were told here in America that even by the Chinese government, right, that China was a developing country. Right? Um, and what did it mean in America to say you, China was a developing country? It meant China was backward. It meant China 
had to learn how to build a modern economy, how to learn how to build a government, how to learn how to make its population to citizens. And modern meant, of course, to be like the West, to be like the West. And yet, you know, if we look around the world to all the countries in the 1960s that were supposedly called developing countries, none of them have equaled China's progress, have equaled China's expansion, none of them. And this is where Chinese history fits in the story. For if we want to understand why China has been so successful, we have to understand, first of all, that it has had a 2000 year old history of centralized government, that it has a tradition of education, that it has long ago learned to manage a densely populated landscape, that it has always aspired to leadership and to greatness. Um, China may have been a developing country in terms of econo the, econo uh, the economy, but it was not a developing country socially, politically, or culturally. Um, and I, so I think we fundamentally misconceived what China was. Now, today we have the United States that all of a sudden finds itself worried about the imbalance of trade with China. Of course, we could have predicted that China very quickly, given its entrepreneurial history and given its level of education and, 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 and uh, many other things that China, given the opportunity to, to participate in the world economy, would have jumped to it very quickly. But thinking of China as a developing country, we didn't pay much attention. Um, China was not, after all, um, only a uh, producer of goods. It was also a great consumer of goods. Um, it was a market for the goods of the world in the past, and it was a producer of goods for the world. Uh, it, this is a small issue, but many of you don't know, perhaps, or maybe you do, that after the new world was discovered, and, and the, really the beginning of global history begins with this discovery of Americas and the sea relationships between Asia, Europe, and the new world, that one third of the silver that was mined in the Americas, uh, uh, in, in Mexico and Peru, actually ended up in China during the Ming Dynasty and early Qing Dynasty. Um, it was a major player in the world economy already then. But how do we get um, from, from, the, from the China of my college days in the 1960s to the China of today? It was not automatic. It was not inevitable. Um, it required making a choice between two paths. Now, we might think, and this is to, I'll, I'll, I'll make my historical point in a second, but we might think that those two paths were represented by, on one hand, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong, Sixiang, Mao Zedong thought. On the other hand, the four modernizations, reform and opening up, right? Gai Ge Kai Fang of Deng Xiaoping. But in fact, the tension between these two models, the path of Mao Zedong's, Mao Zedong Sixiang, and the Wenge and the Cultural Revolution and Deng Xiaoping is a very old path, a very old choice. I want to stress that it's a choice, right? It's a choice that political elites and leaders have to make between what they think the priority of government is, right? Um, it's two visions, two different visions of what the job of government is. One vision says, and it's a traditional Chinese vision too, that the job of government is to transform the population so that they have the same values and adopt the same behaviors. What's called in Chinese, tong dao de yi feng su. This might be called the ideology first model of government, but it's been one of the possibilities for a very long time of how one conceive of the role of government in China. But the other possibility has been there as well, which is that 
The job of government is to secure the welfare and well-being of the population, to make sure that infrastructure was built, that agriculture was, was supported, um, irrigation was supported, and nowadays, of course, it would be not so much that as industry, that material welfare came first. And that's also been one of the ways of thinking about the role of government in Chinese society. And that's one of our jobs, I think, as historians, to remind people that how China is at any one moment is not how China always has been or always will be, but that there always have been choices to be made. And one of the jobs of political leadership is to make choices wisely. Let me tell you my, my third story, which is, comes from a text we all know. And that's the Mengzi, the Mencius. And you remember the very beginning, we all learned this in, in Gaozhong, I think, if not in Chuzhong, um, in, in high school, that uh, the, the book, the Mengzi, the Mencius, begins with the lines, Mengzi jian liang hui wang, wang yue so bu yuan qian li er, er lai, bu yi li wei guo wo, 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 wo guo hu. Um, you've all, so Mencius goes to see the uh, um, King Hui of Liang, the state of Liang, and, and, and the king says, so old man, you've come so many miles to see me. You must have something that will profit my country. And Mencius answers and he says, Wang Hebi Yan Li, you ready are ye. King, why do you talk about profit and advantage? There is only humaneness and rightness or benevolence and righteousness. And I bring that up because I think that um, in politics, the choices one makes, right, are also have to do with the issue of the possibility of thinking in terms of profit and wealth and profit and strength and between justice and righteousness and humanity. The, uh, the issue of the tension between morality and welfare that I've just talked about with something that we could see in the 1960s and 70s and 80s goes back in fact to notions of Mencius as well. And the argument between Mencius and King, King Hui of Liang about what came first, Li Wu Guo, to profit my country, to bring advantage to my country, to my state, or human, uh, mor morality humanity, human, uh, humaneness, benevolence, and righteousness. My, my final story comes from Confucius. You know, our students, not only our students, not only my students, but also many Chinese, Chinese education is all about memorization. There's no creativity. There's no thinking for yourself. Um, my own experience with Chinese students is that they're actually quite critical. They're, they're bashful about criticizing their professors, at least nowadays. During the Cultural Revolution, it was easy to criticize your professors. It was a good thing, right? To uh, your, 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 your professors. But it's true that Chinese students are very tend to be polite, but it doesn't mean they don't think. It doesn't mean they don't ask questions. And when American students or Americans generally sort of think that there's a lack of thoughtfulness on the part of Chinese students, I, 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 I quote this two passages from Confucius, from, from the Lunyu, from, the, from, from, from Kung Fu Tzu. And the first Confucius says, Bu fen, bu qi, bu fei, bu fu, you e you bui san yu fan se bufu ye, which um the translate as follows. Confucius said to somebody who's not eager, in the sense of eager to learn, I do not reveal anything. Nor do I explain anything to somebody who doesn't want to talk back. If I raise one corner and you can't con come back to me with the other three corners, I don't go on. And it seems to me that the fundamental lesson that Confucius is offering there is, I only want to teach people who want to think. 
They want to, they have to want to think. And uh, I think that's a good lesson for American students as well. There's a second passage from Confucius that I like a lot, which is that um, the ancients learned for themselves, today people learn for, for others, to please others. Um, which means I think that, that what Confucius admires is some notion of antiquity as an ideal world where people in, the, in antiquity, when they learned, it was in order to improve themselves. They believed in some sense what we would call a liberal arts education. And today he worries, he worries that people are only concerned with getting ahead. They only learn in order to do what others want them to do. They want to get a practical education. They want to, to advance themselves. They want to get ahead in the world. They want a career. They want, they want talent, skills, uh, but they don't necessarily want to improve themselves. And that tension then, because we all know we need both, right? We need both. We need to be concerned with our cultivation of ourselves, but also with doing things that other people find useful. Otherwise, we're not going to get a job. Um, those two things are, are also true. And so my conclusion from all of this is, as we try to talk to Americans about China and Chinese history, um, it's not enough to tell good stories about China. Right? We need to give people a complex view. We need to get them to see that China is a world not unlike the rest of the world, where there are always choices, where there are different points of view. And the question is always, which side, which side in any debate is going to win out for that moment? But there's never any permanent victory. Right? People always can go back and change their minds. So um, my hope is that as we teach, as we learn in America about China, as we try to spread greater understanding of Chinese history, that one of the consequences of this will be that at least the educated public, the part of public that cares about learning, that cares about science, that thinks it's worthwhile, will develop a view of China that's more nuanced, that's more complex, and can help us, help guide us into a, a better future. So that's what I wanted to say, and thank you very much. I've gone over my time, I think. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Bo, uh, for a very nuanced, um, number of nuanced episodes about Chinese history. I think there's um, some of the examples we'll go back to um, in, the, in the question and answer session. And the audience actually came up with a number of questions, which I'm going to select one from a uh, YP Chang, and which <laughs> I think <laughs> partly you have already answered, but I thought the question is uh, quite clever, maybe from somebody who knows um, the history really well. Professor Bo, if your Chinese teacher, um, Master Yu, is still alive today, of course, he's passed away at age 106 in 2011, how would he assess the current situation between China and the USA? What advice would he give to Chinese Americans to avoid the current wars? Obviously- Oh, what a good question. Uh, uh, Yu Lao. Yu Lao is, is no longer with us. I, I studied with him in the 1970s for around four years and read the Sushu Wu Jing with him. And uh, uh, Y.P. Chan, wonderful to meet a Tong Xue. Um, the, uh, you know, Yu Lao, he was Fang Gong, but he was also Fang Guomindang, as Fan Bei, right? He, he was angry at everybody. He is top ma takai langs langasangas out. So easier say ma ma guoman da ma guntang a ma mei guo do yao ma right. Um, and so I think that uh, the one thing I learned with Yu Lao is that uh, Yu Lao believed in seeing Chinese 
the Chinese cultural tradition, the textual tradition. 不但是是四书五经，也是是是呃呃史学跟文学 ，right? And to see the world through the lens of that culture, of Su Wen, you might say.、Um, but I can't say that I would follow his politics.、Um, I can't say that I would accept the event that he that I would want him to give up political advice. He was a nationalist, but he believed in the restoration of the Qing Dynasty. So, but it's wonderful to meet you. And one, you know, we have the same teacher. Great,、uh, Professor Bo. Back to a number of your、um, stories that you just talk about. If you look at the the wisdom and thoughts from those stories.、Um, And coming back to the current China-American relations, what do you think the Chinese can sort of like use those thoughts and wisdom to sort of help to improve the current tension?、Um, I think that there are a couple. There are a couple of things we need to think about. One is, I think that. One of the things we need is people who know a lot. Of, that people in the United States who know a lot about China, people like me who are Americans who study Chinese history, but people who grew up in China and and bring with it to America their own experience of of Chinese education and learning and their knowledge, is to try to get Americans to see that just as America faces choices. Its politics, so China has choices,、right? and that to try to just reduce things to America is one way, and China is another way is not helpful. I think there's another problem in China, which is that、um, if I look at history departments in the United States, every major university, every single major university in America, has people who teach Chinese history. And、in fact, one of the most popular courses at Harvard, five, six, seven hundred students, is about early Chinese history and early Chinese thought.、Um, I think that in in China,、um, there's a lack of people. There are many people who've been abroad, many people who've been to the United States, many, many people. There have not been a lot of people who study American history, and I think it would be very helpful. To have more people studying American history, so I think we all need to to learn more about each other.、Um, and then within our own countries, we always have work to do. We always have to give a more complex. Intellectuals have a responsibility to give a more complex vision of the world, but politicians don't want complex visions. Politicians want simple visions, as we see. Here in America today. Thank you, Professor. I think this is really、um, sort of a helpful answer, and in, in the sense that this is sort of ties to the mission of NICA, which is actually to have civic engagement, and probably would encourage the doors between the two countries to keep open despite the political differences. Yeah. So、um, I hope. What we talk about today would actually contribute in a small part to this.、Um, there's more questions, but I'm going to select one from the、um, from the the question that was submitted a little bit before. I'm going to actually ask you in Chinese and and English,、huh? and then to see.、Um, so, Bao Jiao Shou, China history generation. 有哪个时期的什么文化跟精神是中国当代缺少的，并值得在当代中国大力弘扬的 ？For example, like、um, the literary spirits or the 士大夫精神 ，or some other things that's actually instrumental in the in the period of change.、Um, what would you say is one or a number of them? 这个这个问题呃不容易回答
，你们我自己的自己研究中国历史的时候，我我就是我不敢说哪一个时代是比哪一个时代好。我说每个时代有他他自己的特色，自己的选择，自己的自己的的的情况。可是我们我大概我们大概可以说，中国有时有些时代是特别复杂。也、yeah, 有呃呃有白花呃有呃这这 a hundred flowers bloom right 呃呃战国时代，呃可是战国时代同时在思想方面是有各种思想，可是从另外方面从政治方面来说是是非常的呃呃呃呃困扰的时代，哎，呃 all these states fighting with each other， 嗯、um,。就围着南北走，虽然没有一个统一的国家 ，but it's it's a very creative period。呃，十一世纪也是一个像那样的的的,的 period with many different points of view are in contention。Um, the twentieth century has been a period。And so it seems to me that that what I would emphasize would be。That there are periods in Chinese history where there have been many different points of view、um, debating with each other, and I think that if I had a period to admire, it would be I'd like to admire those periods when there's debate among different points of view, but peaceful, right? I don't want to return to Zhang Guo Shu Dai, but can we have a period like the 11th century, where there are many different points of view and contention, without having a war,、um, without rebellion, without civil war?、Uh, that would be my ideal. But then, it's not for me to decide, right? It's not for me to decide.、Uh, the burden is always on people who live in China to decide. What they think has to be discussed. What they think is important. Wang、uh, Hua, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay.、Um, It's great that you talk about the the eleventh century, and that actually answer one of the questions in the Q and A session, where one of the audience asked you,、um, Professor Bo, which period of Chinese history has the most barren predictive power toward China today? I think what you described sort of answered that question. Well,、um, well, I hope it will be a model for us in looking at the past to think about what China can be. Right, with、uh, a open discussion of opinion and difference. Got it.、Um, one more question from a Mr. Charles Charlie Wang, and he asked,、um, just like how important events in American history are often left out of the curriculum, can you talk about? Oh. Sorry, it's a.、Uh, do you believe the opposing political ideology of China can coexist? I do not believe the current tension are rooted between the peoples, but more between fundamental social and political values.、Uh, so Charlie Wang's question is very good.、Um, the question I would have is is.、Uh, If we look at America today, since we have an, this is something we live, we all live here, we all know about, right? We all experience on a day-to-day -day basis if we watch the news.、Um, what is the American ideology? What's the American ideology? Is it the ideology of Trump? Is it、uh, Trump or Sichuan, or is it some other ideology of Biden or something else?、Um, I, I, it's very hard to say, from my perspective, if there's an Ameri American ideology. I would have said before. I would have said before that 
that the idea of, of democracy, rather than meritocracy, democracy is a shared value in America. But I've been persuaded by Trump and his supporters that democracy is not a shared value. I don't think that Trump believes in democracy, right? I don't think he believes in meritocracy either for that matter, but um, I, I think in China, there's a belief that, that meritocracy is more important than a democracy and that China has a meritocratic system where people are chosen and selected by merit. And yet the government has an anti-corruption campaign, which suggests that the government itself is not sure that merit, that merit works in practice. Right? So I think our two countries, we might, in fact, let me make a radical suggestion. When I was a student in the 1970s, after graduating from college in the 1970s, I went to study in Taiwan, which is where I studied the Sishu Wu Jing with Yu Lao for three, four years. And when I went there, China was on under martial law. No, not China. Um, well, China was under the Cultural Revolution, but in Taiwan, it was martial law of Jiang Jieshi. Right? And Chinese students, fellow students, said to be, we Chinese students said to be, And so it's interesting because there is a belief that there has had to be strong leadership, central leadership, democracy was not part of the Chinese tradition, and it certainly wasn't, but also a belief to some extent in meritocracy. And yet today, Taiwan combines meritocracy with democracy in a way that has led it to have a better government than the United States, right? To be more effective in providing for popular welfare, for education, right? And so it seems to me that, that the possibilities of, you, of combining some things of democratic ideals and meritocratic ideals, it's not impossible. It's not impossible. I think that generally speaking, you know, I think people in China or students in China know much more about America and the West than American students know about China. So in the end, I guess what I want to say is that my job, my job is to try to help American students know more about China and not to say to them that there's one Chinese ideology, but to say that there are multiple Chinese ways of thinking. And we choose which ones we agree with. And the China, people in China have to choose which ones they agree with too. Huh? To Jansen. Thank you, Professor Bao. Uh, there is another question that came in the uh, Q&A which is from a Tanya Harvey Martin. And the question is, just like how important events in American history are often left out of the curriculum, can you talk about the process professors follow when deciding how to design a curriculum on Chinese history? That is a very good question because you put your finger on something that's always true, that the teaching of history is always in the present. And when we teach history, we also look to the past and we read it. We read the past through our concerns with the present. So inevitably, we tend to find those things in the past that speak to, that help us understand where we are in the present. Um, there are lots of examples we can think of this, but I'll give you one example which many of you will remember in 1989, right? when uh, the, uh, the student demonstrations in Tiananmen and everyone who did Chinese studies at Harvard was very, very concerned. And every day there would be a meeting at the end of the day where all the students and the professors would gather together and talk about what's going on. And after the Tiananmen massacre, 
I remember a prof- somebody getting up and saying, ah, right? What could you expect? Um, the Chinese government has always been autocratic. It would always suppress you know, any kind of resistance. Nothing surprising, we should have expected this. And then Professor Benjamin Schwartz at Harvard, the late professor, he passed away a number of years ago, got up and said, why do I disagree with that guy? He said, because I know that if the things had gone the other way, if the leadership had li- listened to the students and agreed, we all would have said, right? that there's a long tradition in China of political leaders listening to the educated elite, listening to students. And so what we choose to talk about in the past, if we think today China is a nationalistic, chauvinistic, sort of dictatorship. If we want to, we can pick out examples from Chinese history that say China is just like this. Or we can say China sometimes is like this and sometimes is not like this. So that I think is how you, the question is how you as a teacher approach history. Do you approach it from the view of what I want to what I think is right today, what I want people to follow and believe, or do I want to help enlighten people about what the choices are? That's my my answer to that. May not be good enough, but that's my answer. Thank you. There is a, the good questions keep coming. So I will encourage the audience to think about what you want to ask. And I'm basically basing on the like function in the Q&A. If you think one question is something that resonates with you, please do put a like on the screen so I can see the votes and basically pick that question. <laughs> so Professor Bo, there's another yeah. question from a dog, Leard. Um, how, how do you think of a, the US should respond to the repressions in Hong Kong and of the Uyghurs? Yeah. So I, I, I think, so there are two kinds of answers, right? There's one which is as an historian, how do we understand what's happening? And there's another kind of question was how as an American, do I think the American government should respond? Right? And I'm going to give a complicated answer. Um, and, and I think the answer is between, the, there, there are very important differences between Xinjiang and Xiangang, between Xinjiang and Hong Kong. I don't think we can treat them the same way. Let's talk about uh, Xinjiang first. If we look at maps of China, Han, Tang, Han, Weijin, Tang, uh, Sung, Yuan, Mingqing, right? what we see is that China's borders have changed enormously over time. And sometimes it's included Xinjiang and sometimes not. Um, The big question between the notion of Zhongguo, the, the, the central country, China, and, and Idi, the tribal peoples around it, is do you have separation or do you have integration? Are those people going to be part of the Zhongguo or are they going to be outside of it? Do you want to keep a separation or do you want to include? And if you want to include, you have a second choice. Do you want to integrate or do you want to have multiculturalism? Hmm? That has been a debate with a long history, a long history, with some people saying multiculturalism is okay if we include within our dynasty, within our, our, our diguo, or within our empire, within whatever we have, these other peoples, we can let them sort of have their own life. And there are other people that have said in the past, no, if they're going to be within the country, they must disappear 
as an independent people, they must have, they must have the, the values of the majority. Right? Now, we have the same issue today in America in arguments about multiculturalism. Are we talking about integration where we have shared values, shared standards, or are we talking about having different groups of people, each of whom has a piece of the pie and has its own standards, no life value? I'm an integrationist, I'm afraid. I believe in integration. I believe in shared standards. But remember that in China today, although in Xinjiang there's a policy of, and, and in Mongolia, there's now a policy of trying to diminish ethnic autonomy and ethnic identity. The policy of the Chinese government after 1949 was multiculturalism. To have, uh, you know, zizhi, uh, dichu, right? to have places that would have their own ethnic identity. So the Chinese government since 1949, since Jeff has had different points of view about how to deal with the peoples on the borders who had different languages, different histories, and different political histories, but who are now part of the map of China. Um, what's the right way to handle that? It's a very difficult question. You know, if what would happen if Xinjiang was independent? How would the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs get along? Big question, right? Big question. How does a country that's landlocked have a safe existence? If we look at Kazakhstan and all the other stans, is would Xinjiang just be another one of those? I don't know. Now, Hong Kong, it seems to me, is a very different situation with a very different history. And um, China signed an agreement on the basic law with England. Should China honor that agreement? Many people would say, I think probably so. I think, but on the other hand, the English signed the agreement because they thought that within 50 years, China would change. That wouldn't be a communist party controlling everything. So they made a wrong bet too, perhaps. We'll see. I think I've avoided a question. Well, it's a, it's a very nuanced answer, Professor Bo, to give a history in the context of what is the current situation. I think the audience would appreciate that. Um, and I see the question keep on coming. And the highest ranked question now is Professor Bo. It's from an audience, um, Ping Guo Zhang. In the era of engagement with China, Chinese Americans could collaborate with scientists in Chinese institutions. Now China is considered an adversary. How should Chinese Americans do in terms of international research collaboration? Very timely. <laughs> okay. So when you say China is considered an adversary, let me rephrase that and say the Trump administration is pushing forward the idea that we should think of China as an adversary and that scholarship should be national rather than international. But you know, the same moon that shines over Cambridge tonight is the same moon that shines over Beijing. There are certain things that are truly international and science is one of them. Is it true that governments will try to use science and promote science to benefit themselves? Yes, of course, we know that. We know that governments will see science as an area of competition, we know that. But in the end, are we as, a human, as humankind going to be better for cooperation in science? Yes. I think so. Um, should we try to encourage cooperation? Yes. Will this current government and current policy be in place forever? No. Even if Trump gets reelected, this current policy will not be in place forever. Right? Um, and in fact, you know, it's very possible that if Trump were elected, he could change his mind tomorrow. But again, do not equate 
the policy of the American government at a certain moment with the long-term policy of American government. Because in the end, the interest of the United States, of China, of humanity, lies in intellectual collaboration and understanding. Got it. Um, thank you, Professor. There is, so I want to remind the audience, if you like some questions, go vote on the Q&A so that we can see which question is highly ranked. I'm going to pick another one that's highly ranked. Uh, it's from SC Chu. The question is, some US foreign policy hands say that the conflict between China and the US are rooted in, sorry, in difference in values. How many value do you think is, um, is difference between the two countries, whether there's value differences or self-interest? So I guess we would say that in general, we expect governments to act out of their understanding of what the interest of their country is. And the interest of their country is sometimes put, and very often put, in terms of um, putting their country's interest above and at the expense of other countries' interests. But let me rephrase that for us as people who are academics and intellectuals and students, which is a matter of horizons. I can see my interest as being very narrow as a person, right? I'm interested in my family. Remember the argument Mengzi has with Modes, right? He says, Modes says you should treat everybody's father as your fa father. There should be no distinction. We should have Jenai. Right? And Manchester said, no, no, you can't do that. You always begin with the assumption that you have a father and your father matters more than somebody else's father. True enough. We're going to value our immediate kin more than other people's. And we're going to evaluate, perhaps we evaluate our own locality where we live more than the neighboring locality. Perhaps we seek to get advantage at their expense. We say, well, we need the water for our farmers here, so let's take it away from them. But maybe, and this goes all the way up to the level of country, but maybe we should say, we don't want to be yixiang zhishu, we want to be qian sha zhishu. We want to be people, literati, uh, sure, who think about not just their own locality, but the whole world. And so it's a question of how broad we see our horizons, right? The great challenge for political leaders is to have, decide how broad they can have their horizons, how far they can see, how many people they can include. And I think it was since probably really since World War II, since 1945, the American government has tended, has tended, not always, but has tended to have reasonably broad horizons, or at least broader than sometimes. And I think today China is also a country that wants to have broad horizons, right? But not totally broad. No one is totally broad, totally inclusive. But perhaps we as individuals want to see them have broader horizons than they sometimes have. Clearly, the American government at the moment has very narrow horizons. In the previous regime, the Obama government had very broad and had much broader horizons. Um, so we'll see. Thank you. Great, thanks. Another question that's highly ranked, Professor Bo, is, in your learning in Taiwan and in mainland, what are the key cultural differences between the two societies? Ah, what a wonderful question. What a wonderful question. None. Um, but then if you ask me, what are the key cultural differences between the two societies, between America and, and the United no, States? Taiwan and mainland China. And, and China between the United States and China I might say none too. So, no, yeah, sorry. The, uh, it depends at 
what's our level of analysis, right? What's our no level of analysis? When my friend in China says to me, you Americans have no individuality, but that's what I admire about you. You have no individuality, right? And Americans say, but we have individuality and, and you don't. Well, um, clearly we have a misunderstanding in place, but at some level they must both be true. Um, I think that we need to ask the question at the moment. Right? When I was a student in Taiwan, people were very, were, were fairly afraid to speak about many things. I, I wrote a, uh, an article in a newspaper because a friend of mine uh, who was an editor asked me to, it's the first thing I ever published that talked about studying Zhongguo Wenhua in Taiwan. And I, and I made the mistake of saying, by and large, people in Taiwan do not care about Zhongguo Wenhua. Right? Even though at, at the, the Kohao at the time was Fuxin Zhongguo Wenhua. Um, everyone who I knew in academic life agreed that that was true, but I got into a lot of trouble. The editor, that part of the newspaper who asked me to write it, got in a lot of trouble, right? He lost his job. Um, all sorts of things happened. Right? No one was put in prison. No one was, no one was locked away. But at that moment in Taiwan, right, there were things you could not say. You were punished for saying them. Today, I think that's not true. So today in China, are there things you can be punished for saying? Yes, there are. So is that a difference in values or is that a particular political moment in a particular political situation? I think it's a particular political association. If we ask fundamentally, are there different values? I would come back again to the question and say that if I make a really large generalization, I think Americans tend to be more concerned with individual rights rather than their responsibilities towards other people. And I think people in China and in Taiwan both believe that individuals need to think about their responsibilities towards other people. And I think the evidence for that has been evident in both Taiwan and in uh, the mainland in China having to do with the pandemic, right? In, in the mainland, there was a great deal of government control and it was very successful in stopping the pandemic. In Taiwan, there was a less government control and a great deal of emphasis on responsibility and it was very successful in stopping the pandemic. Right? Um, but both of those rest on some notion that individuals have responsibilities towards others. And in America, that's been much, and in parts of Europe, that's been much harder to make the case that responsibility towards others is more important than individual rights. Great, thank you. So I know that we are going to wrap up at about 8.15 today. So there's time for two questions. I'm going to actually ask one question first, but I want to sort of uh, tell you what the last question will be. So the last question will be, in 2013年,哈佛大学上线了一门视频在线公开课,中国课,包必德教授跟柯伟林两位教授在课程中唱起了自编自改的歌曲《两只老虎》的中国朝代歌,夜间在中国拥有了巨多学术界之外的 粉丝，请问包比德教授可以在现场一起啊跟我们唱这个两只老虎吗？ <laughs> That's the last question. Okay, so before that, I want to ask a question from uh, uh, our co-host Ge Chen today. Um, 是什么原因让中国在七世纪到十七世纪长达一千年的时间一直站在世界民族之巅？您觉得中国这一千年？ 非常成功的原因是什么? Hmm. 
So this is really looking over a thousand year periods from the Tang Dynasty to the end of the Ming, which is sort of the period that I'm most interested in studying. Um, so let's, the problem, the problem and the difficulty in answering this question, and it's really difficult to answer without, without long lectures, is that if we look at where China was in the eighth century, eighth, ninth century, right? Where it is in the 11th century. In the 11th century, China has a highly commercialized tax system. The government is expanding its, its role, right? Um, the nature of land ownership has changed from the eighth century to the 11th century. In the 12th century, right? Half of China is lost to the new gen who invade the Hubei Pingyuan. Um, and then you have a government that's smaller, that's less active. And then you have the, Mong the Mongols who invade from the north, who invade the Jin dynasty in the north and then the Song in the south. Um, and who create a world empire, but a world empire that in China doesn't care anything about the Chinese population, who sees the Chinese population as a source of manpower and money for fighting wars. Right? Um, the worst of all possible governments. And then you have the Ming Dynasty, right, uh, that tries to establish a, 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 a more peaceful, stable society, but in some sense, is a, at first very much against commerce and a commercial development. And yet by the end of the Ming Dynasty, you have this tremendous part, China becomes part of a, an emerging global economy. So to say Zhongguo Changgong, it, it, it's not so easy, right? To say that China succeeded as much as there were ups and downs, right? That overall history is, is change, it's cyclical change and yet it gets better over time, right? There's, it's cumulative, maybe not better, but it's cumulative at least. Um, and that's, I guess, um, what makes China interest, Chinese history, history interesting is that it's not just one story. It's not as if the story goes like that. The story goes like that and around and about and up again and down again. It's a, it's a real story. Real story, it's complicated. Um, that's why historians can earn a living because it's complicated but it is one of the great stories in human civilization. Um, remember that to talk about Chinese history is to talk about one fourth to one fifth of the world's population. And if we are going to have a notion of a, of a sh common world today, and this is where making choices about the past is so important in thinking about history. If we are going to have a shared existence in the world today, we are also, going to have to recognize that we all have a history that's that may begin apart, but eventually becomes connected. And the question is, do we want to accept that? Do we want to welcome it or not? And I think we should welcome it. I think we should be happy about it. And I think we should encourage it. And when in our own countries, we find people who want to stop it, to block it, um, we should speak from knowledge to ignorance and try to change the way they think about it. That's the best I can do, but it's not, you know, it's a complicated, not easy answer. Okay, so do you want to, uh, what did you want to do? Uh, yeah, uh, so I want to- You wanted to sing a song? Yeah, I, I would say that would be a really great closing. Um, before we do that, I want to thank our co-host, um, Mr. Ben Xia, Mr. Ge, uh, Ms. Gechen, uh, Professor Wang Hua, and many 
co-host in NICA. And especially I want to be really thankful to Professor Bo for taking your time to give us a very nuanced and a complex answer on Chinese history and find a relevancy to where we are facing today. I think history is a really good teacher. It's a messy uh, subject to talk about. And we rarely get a chance to actually talk in such a depth about a history and in a very balanced view. For that, um, I want to thank Professor Bo on behalf of all the participants. And also want to thank all the participants today. You have been terrific and highly interactive. And this is really something that could give us the reason to ask the questions that most of you want to ask. So with that, I want to give the forum to Professor Bo to see, we can sing along in the virtual okay. Uh, okay. session. So, and so, so let me tell you the background of this. We needed to get American students to think, to try to keep in mind some notion of um, the history of China built around Chao Dai, about dynasties, right? And so the song, which actually is not, I didn't make up, I learned it from one of our students, um, was uh, basically uh, to help students remember that the Han dynasty came before the Tang dynasty, for example. And so the song, as, as you say, is, uh, uh, is, is based on, on an American song. It's Nangzhi Lao Hu in Chinese, but it's Frere Jacques, Brother Jacques, Jack in, in English, and it goes, and of course you can sing it in multiple parts, but if everyone sings it together, it goes, Shangzhou Qinan, Shangzhou Qinan, Sui Tang Song, Sui Tang Song, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Ming Guo, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong. So um, that's how we do it. And so now you all have to begin. It, by the way, because there's a little bit of lag on Zoom, it never works to sing it together, but we'll try. Okay. Shang Zhou Qin Han, Shang Zhou Qin, Wei Tang Song, Wei Tang Song, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Zhang Wenhua. Appreciated it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor. It was a great. Thank you, Ben. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Yeah.